Hello, welcome to the Ponderings Podcast. In this episode, I'm going to be talking about Bergson's notion of intuition. These podcast episodes can be found on any podcast hosting site, such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Anchor, etc. Um, This podcast can also be found on YouTube. I post the episodes every week. I will continue to elaborate on Henry Bergson's philosophy, specifically his conception of intuition. And if you have not watched episode 9, the episode previous to this one, I encourage you to do so because this episode is a sort of continuation of it. I'm most likely going to be talking about Henry Bergson in the next episode as well, so it's sort of like a little series on a brief introduction into his philosophy and his different um, concepts and notions. So firstly, I'll begin by doing a small recap of the last episode on time and free will. In the last episode, I gave an overview of Bergson's refutation of Kant's notion of freedom. Kant proposed that human action was determined by natural causality. So cause and effect. All natural events occur in time and are thoroughly determined by causal chains that stretch backwards into the distant past. There's no room for freedom in nature due to this deterministic cause and effect. There's no spontaneity or novelty because everything is sort of determined. There are laws in nature. There's also a juxtaposition of events. They're separate from each other. There, something happens, which is a cause for something else, or it's a cause for an effect that later happens. It's a mechanistic causality which Kant sort of proposes. So Henry Bergson has a twofold response to Kant's conception of freedom. So he first proposes that we should differentiate our notions of time and space. He thinks that Kant has a sort of confused outlook on what time and space is, because Kant sees that, sees time and space as something that's happening outside of our, I guess, reality. It's something independent from our reality that just happens on its own. It's like a separate sort of substance in itself. Um, So for a person, he thinks time and space are deeply integrated with reality and we are, we are time and space in a way. And so it's not like there's, you know, mind, there's time and space and all these other things. They're all very interrelated for Bergson. Um, The immediate data of consciousness for Bergson is defined as temporal or duration itself. In this duration, which would be time, there's no juxtaposition of events. So no mechanistic causality. And again, juxtaposition of events, it's saying that things are like next to each other. They're substances. For Bergson, there's no such thing as substances or things in themselves. Everything is a process. So there are relations, events, all these beings are composed of relations and they relate to one another. Events are relational. They're not sort of this event caused this, but there's it's a lot more complex than just this causes this, or this happens, so this happens. It's a lot more fluid, less mechanistic. And as a result, in this duration, there's the experience of freedom. And that's why Bergson is like, okay, Kant, your notion of like natural causality, this deterministic causality, sort of doesn't allow for freedom because there's no... Um, concept of sort of possibility or uh, potentials it's all sort of determined by all by the past and of course for Bergson the past is relevant but there's also like an openness to possibilities and potentials and it's not mechanistic so there's this fluidity there's experience of novelty and freedom that comes about So Bergson explains this difference between his and Kant's notion of space and time. He explains the difference between qualitative multiplicity and quantitative multiplicity. So 
Quantitative multiplicity should be likened to substance ontology, which is the enumeration of things or states of consciousness by externalizing one from the other in the same space. So a quantitative multiplicity would be like uh, ascribing symbols to things or representations, numbering things, um, images, labeling, uh, ascribing categories. That's what a quantitative multiplicity is. So we're sort of ascribing our human intelligence, the way we organize things, to how the outside world works. So Bergson's like, no, this isn't. It, this is not entirely correct. Um, he proposes more of a qualitative multiplicity. So it's like qualitative multiplicity is likened to process ontology, which is the notion that several conscious states are organized into a whole, and they permeate one another and they gradually gain a richer content through this act of organizing and permeating one another. So a being is a process of becoming. They cannot be clearly enumerated, symbolized, or defined categorically. So we use symbols, representations, numbers, images, all these things are abstract. They don't actually, we can't quantify like our reality. So that's why quantitative multiplicity cannot ever be used to correctly um, illustrate how our reality is. So we have to see our reality as more uh, of a phenomenological thing, a qualitative lens. All right, so that was a short recap to the last episode. So now let's get into Bergson and intuition. So he uses intuition or his conception of intuition is a method to restore the possibility of absolute knowledge for Bergson. Um, he attempts to place his concept of intuition above the divisions of different schools of philosophy. Um, so these different schools would be empiricism, idealism, realism, rationalism, etc. He refrains from taking sides or having to choose between concepts or these different schools. He says that our human intelligence has the tendency to categorize and label in order to make sense of experience. This intelligence, this human intelligence is guided by needs. Therefore, it is relevant knowledge. So this knowledge is gathered through analysis, which for Bergson is the ability to divide things according to perspectives taken. This knowledge is gained through reconstruction and recomposition of analytic knowledge by means of synthesizing perspectives. So synthesis satisfies ever-present needs of the individual, but it never gives us the thing itself. It only gives us the general concept of things. Again, like what I was saying before, uh, numbering, symbols, representation, images, all these are abstract concepts that we use in order to make sense of our reality, but they cannot give us an accurate, we can't accurately define reality with these quantitative mechanisms. And these quantitative mechanisms are things we use in order to synthesize um, different perspectives. Um, and our human intelligence then can sort of be likened to a sort of habitual intelligence because we are habitually synthesizing different perspectives, different um, ideas, concepts. We're synthesizing them to, to continue to create more sense of the world. So Bergson proposes that intuition serves as a temporary reversal of the normal working of intelligence. So the synthesis of perspectives, this habitual intelligence, um, intuition sort of stops that um, organization in its tracks and sort of allows us to gain knowledge in a different way that is less abstract and more in tune with how reality actually functions. Mm -hmm. This normal working of intelligence is a development of analysis. Um, the turn of experience, which Bergson coins as what intuition is, is when this synthesized analysis or habitual intelligence becomes concerned with human experience, so phenomenology, right? 
um, being concerned with the experience as it's happening. Intuition is a kind of experience, and intuition for Bergson is the true empiricism, the true way of gaining absolute knowledge or gaining yeah absolute knowledge of the world because it's it's more accurate for Bergson and Bergson he likens intuition to the emotion sympathy um going back to qualitative multiplicity that's you know process experience being as process of becoming he states that intuition consists in entering into the thing instead of going around it from the outside like with analysis instead of abstracting it from the thing or from the process itself he likens it to sympathy it consists in putting ourselves in the place of others the entering into for Bergson is what gives us absolute knowledge it's a seizing of the other or a seizing of oneself in entering into ourselves through this process of intuition or entering into, we are installing ourselves within this duration. So Burson sees reality as duration. It is time. It, it's a process. It's happening. And when we get away from our habitual intelligence, our habitual way of analyzing things, of abstracting things, we sort of enter into the duration, enter into this intuitive experience and intuition is always an intuition of duration so it's always just entering into this experience without analyzing it or abstracting it this absolute knowledge at the end of the day it's not something that we can um necessarily speak about accurately we can try to use words to speak about this sort of experience or our human experience, but it's just something that is felt. It's something that we enter into. So an example of entering into duration is Bergson's color spectrum example. So when one installs oneself or enters into duration, there's a certain well-defined tension which manifests itself as choice amidst an infinity of possible durations. So we're going to use Bergson's color spectrum image example to illustrate this. Um, suppose there is no other color other than orange. If we could enter into orange, we would sense ourselves caught between red and yellow. Meaning that if we make an effort to enter into or perceive orange, we would sense a variety of shades. The darkest shade of orange, which would be close to red, and then the lightest shade of orange, which would be close to yellow. So entering into duration puts us into a whole continuity of durations. So when we're sort of entering into our process or when we're in this non-analytic sort of uh, state of being and we're just present or being, we're, we're putting ourselves into the whole continuity of durations, this continuous experience where we're able to see all these possible um, choices. We're, we're, we're presented with an, with an infinity of possible durations. So intuition becomes an intuition of what is other. This sort of plurality versus singularity. Intuition as self-sympathy, like entering into the color orange, reveals that we can only have knowledge of a component part, not the entirety of the duration. So we can only have absolute knowledge of a specific instance, a specific um, moment or experience, but we don't have absolute knowledge of all experiences, only the fact that each experience is related to all of the rest of the experiences. So there is a multiplicity or a plurality of durations, and intuition gives us access to the present, relevant, continuous duration as well as the range of possible durations. So I can dilate or enlarge, or I can follow upwardly or downwardly. I can like see all these different possible durations in front of me or behind me, but I can't access them all at the same time. So again, this is only a partial expression, 
only a part of the duration, which means that intuition never gives us absolute knowledge of the whole of the duration, only the component parts of the duration, only a contracted part is given. Um, this experience requires an integration of an infinity of durations. So every single duration that comes into existence must be related as a part to all the other instances of duration. So this is similar to Whitehead with that um, ability to prehend um, occasions of experience, only the ones that are relevant, and we're constantly prehending occasions of experience to create a sort of novel concrescence, this novel production of togetherness, where we have the ability to intuit single durations and create a sort of novel togetherness out of these single durations in each moment. Duration is that to which everything is related. Absolute knowledge is possible for Bergson through the integral experience of durations as relations or parts of the whole of duration. Um, intuition is made up of an indefinite series of acts that directly relate to the varying degrees of duration, which is time. So intuition for Bergson is enacted as a method. This is why intuition is a method for Bergson. It's something that you sort of um, go into, you enter into as a kind of leap, an effort to reverse the normal working of habitual intelligence. You enter into, you, you leap into this duration. And then secondly, you, you have to make an effort to dilate um, your duration into this continuous plurality or multiplicity. So you have to dial it to maybe like an extreme version of orange or, or a lesser version of orange, like red or yellow. You're sort of dilating into how um, much awareness or intuition you want to have when you leap into this duration, if that makes any sense. And then the third part of this method, this intuitive leap, is that you have to make an effort to differentiate these different shades or degrees of duration, like with the color orange. Differentiate the shades, the extremes, the relevant possibilities. So intuition is likened to memory, not perception. It is a cutting into duration. You're cutting into experience and you're, pie you're piecing together all of the relevant shades or degrees of duration. You're integrating, you're synthesizing, but in this case, you're not synthesizing perspectives or concepts, you're synthesizing possibilities, moments of experience, duration, drops of experience, like Whitehead says. Um, so an example is a tailor who sews pieces of cloth together into clothes that fit. Um, intuition is a method to confront the mixtures of duration in the everyday experience. Intuition illustrates how the differentiated parts are sewn together to enact a continuous process. Entering into duration where we have the ability to sort of come into contact with this process or feel this process as it's happening. It's getting in touch with that feeling of time passing and you as well passing. In the next episode, I'm gonna be elaborating on this concept of memory and how intuition is sort of more likened to memory than perception, according to Bergson. Luckily, you were able to understand some of that. Um, I will definitely be giving a little recap in the next episode before I get into memory and how it relates to intuition. Um, on that note, I hope that you were able to learn some things about Henry Bergson's concept of intuition. Um, thank you for listening, and stay tuned.